Well, everyone, we now officially know a lot more about Intel's Arrow Lake S. There's some really incredible things going on here, but there's a lot of items that a lot of you will feel like are a big step backwards for Intel and the desktop CPU market in general. So basically what I wanted to do here is I want to go through all of the elements that Intel told us about and what we would expect from Arrow Lake S when reviews go live a little bit later this month. But first, a message from our sponsor. I don't know how Fantex does it, but the XT lineup offers incredible value for your money with these mid-towers. The interior is ready for today's challenging needs with a 360 up top, up to 10 120 mil fans, any GPU would fit, it's BTF ready, and your choice of a cool presentation with the XT View model or high performance with the XT Pro and Pro Ultra. All of the illumination is tasteful and a appreciate it at this price point and everything is double boxed with protective corners so the XTs travel safe. Check them out below and spend responsibly. So let's start right off the top with the specs of the Arrow Lake S lineup. And this is maybe a good thing because it seems like Intel has condensed things down to a little bit more compact format here. So there's just three different core layouts both with and without integrated GPUs. They range from 24 cores on the Ultra 9 to 14 cores on the Ultra 5. And just like on Lunar Lake laptop chips, the desktop processors lack SMT, so they have an equal number of cores and threads. Meanwhile, the maximum achievable clock speeds have a 500 megahertz delta between the lowest and highest end CPUs. Just like with Lunar Lake, the instructions per clock or IPC in Arrow Lake got a shot of adrenaline versus what we saw in Raptor Lake, especially those E cores. Arrow Lake processors, they're gonna be relying heavily on those IPC uplifts though, since maximum clock speeds have been dialed back by quite a bit. And to balance that out, Intel has also augmented the base frequency, which points towards the Ultra 200K series possibly being able to run at higher speeds for longer periods of time. And that'll be absolutely necessary since with the elimination of simultaneous multi-threading on the P cores, every processor here has a lower overall thread count than their predecessors. And look, by this point in SMT's life, we know that real cores are better than virtual ones, but by how much, we'll just have to see. Pricing on the other hand, well, it's a bit lower than the 14th and 13th gen CPUs launched for, but not by all that much. A few bucks here and there, but nothing more. Overlay the Ryzen 9000 series onto this, at least at their current average selling prices across the US, and you can see exactly what Intel is doing. They're finding those gaps in AMD's lineup and parachuting a chip into each of them. So the Ultra 9 285K undercuts the 9950X, but costs more than the 9900X. The Ultra 7 265K lands between the 9900X and 9700X, while the Ultra 5 245K narrowly undercuts the 9700X's new lower price. So that's all great, but there's actually a big elephant in the room here for the enthusiast desktop market specifically. And that is Arrow Lake S has been designed from the ground up to put efficiency before overall performance. And that's actually, I guess, good news because if you remember when Raptor Lake and Alder Lake were released, there was flames everywhere. Everybody was critiquing it because it ran too hot and it was too power hungry. So that's really good news, right? Well, not so fast because the Ultra 9 and Ultra 7 processors still have the same base and maximum turbo power envelopes as their predecessors. Meanwhile, the Ultra 5 245K goes up to 159 watts. That doesn't mean the processors will actually hit those maximum values all day, every day. But just because Intel says they're efficient, it doesn't mean they're rated to consume less power in an all core workload at least. And I think this one point and that sustained power will be a super critical factor in any evaluation of Arrow Lake. Raptor Lake K-series chips were designed to hit their maximum turbo power almost all the time or even go above that provided they were given enough cooling. So will Arrow Lake chips do the exact same as Raptor Lake, meaning that they are no less power hungry than the previous generation. Well, we have no way of knowing that because what they could be doing here is using that 159 watt to 250 watt power envelope as guidelines. It could be that in everyday scenarios or even in all core workloads, they could be consuming a lot less than that. A lot really hinges on the answer to that question and we'll only get answers once we're able to actually review these chips. Remember, past a certain point, pumping 
putting more power into any CPU tends to give you ever diminishing returns. We saw it with Lunar Lake on the laptop side, and we're seeing it again here with performance per watt scaling really falling off above 150 watts. So to me, what it looks like here is that we have an architecture that is being pushed for all it's worth in order to just compete in the enthusiast desktop space. But there is a silver lining here, and that is how Intel is treating power consumption in lightly threaded workloads, which is good for pretty much everyone because PCs, they're not a one dimensional object. Even gamers tend to buy a PC and expect it to do everything from productivity to gaming and sometimes a lot more. A lot of games are also lightly threaded too, and that focus on efficiency in lightly threaded scenarios, well, it can directly lead to power reductions in gaming too. Sometimes the effects can be huge when comparing the 285K to the 14900K. Naturally, some titles will be affected more than others, and less power consumption leads to lower temperatures when both chips are running on an identical cooler. Considering heat was one of the main critiques of previous Intel generations, well, this should be an easy win for them. And if this all comes true, there could be some really big trickle down effects to specifically for the SFF market. So imagine running a higher end Intel chip without having to tweak it on a cooler like this while running this at anything but the 100% fan speed that you would have to right now. The other thing that you have to remember is that less overall wattage means less heat is actually being dumped into your case. So a hyper-focus on efficiency with lower clocks and reduced thread counts leads to less performance, right? Well, not really. At least not according to Intel, since the 285K seems to get relatively good performance increases versus the 14900K, and that also leads to a narrow lead over the 9950X, at least in Intel's own benchmarks. And then we have single thread performance, and I'll be honest with you, during the briefing, this is where I really pumped the brakes and said, yikes. Instead of the massive leap forward we saw with Lunar Lake versus 14th gen chips, Arrow Lake sees a barely incremental bump here. And again, Zen 5, well, Intel comes really, really close to losing the single thread performance crown, and that's not a good thing. And in order to mitigate some of the shortcomings we're seeing, Intel has upgraded the graphics core on these chips to their XE LPG architecture, though only with a four core layout. I mean, they know anyone rocking a K-series CPU will be using a discrete GPU for gaming, but what XE adds here is a completely upgraded media engine that has pretty powerful encode and decode capabilities, which are so critical for media co-processing. So efficiency is one thing, great, fine, and dandy. But if there was one thing people were hoping for from this generation of Intel CPUs is that we would have a new gaming champ on our hands, or at least until AMD launches their Ryzen 9000 X3D chips. But unfortunately, take a breath here, that is not going to happen. Because even according to Intel themselves, the Ultra 9 to 85K will be no faster than the 14900K in gaming. It wins some and loses some, all while consuming less power. But when the dust settles on most benchmark suites, the best Arrow Lake chip won't offer higher gaming frame rates than its predecessor. Let that sink in for a second. But look closer and there's a few things going on here that might actually be stacking the deck in Intel's favor. Like a bunch of these results were run using their application optimizer or APO, which could have inflated the numbers. There's also, for some reason, two F1 games, but I gotta give it to them, there's still a fair number of newer titles too. Unlike AMD, there's no Strange Brigade or six-year-old Tomb Raider, thank God. I also need to call out that the results were done with an RTX 4090, but at 1080p on high settings. And that tends to tighten things up a bit when compared to some reviews which test at 1080p low or even 720p. Technically, the Ultra 9 285K also trades blows with the 9950X, being no faster or slower across most games. Though if a benchmark suite skews one way or another in terms of games favoring specific platforms, there could be a narrow win for either side. You'll also notice that the game selection here is a bit different from the last chart. So obviously Intel is doing a bit of cherry picking, but I've got to give credit where it's due. They're showing a pretty balanced picture here with a mix of good and bad results rather than it being all sunshine and roses. And yet AMD's X3D chips will probably still dominate overall, especially the 7800X3D or whatever AMD's plans are for the 9000X3D series. However, if you're more of a hybrid user that uses your desktop for creative tasks alongside gaming, well, you've always had a tough decision. And Arrow Lake, honestly, it doesn't make that decision any easier. So for a lot of people, 
These results, they're gonna prompt a lot of negativity. They're gonna say that, you know what, Arrow Lake, even before it's released, it's a flop. It just can't keep up in the one area where you were hoping an enthusiast platform from Intel would excel, and that's in gaming. But it's not all over yet because there's a few other things that I need to discuss. First of all, there's memory compatibility. Since Intel has bumped speeds up from Raptor Lake's officially supported 5600 mega transfers per second to 6400, while the maximum capacity remains 192 gigabytes with 48 gigabytes per DIMM. There's also the possibility of running upcoming CU DIMMs, which use an integrated clock driver on the DIMM itself to stabilize communications between the memory modules and the motherboard at higher speeds. With those modules, Intel told us that DDR5-8000 is probably going to be a sweet spot for Arrow Lake, since the processor's IMC can still run synchronized in Gear 2 mode. As for overclocking, there's good news and some bad news. Intel says they've squeezed every conceivable bit of performance out of their P cores, so most overclocking will likely be focused on the E cores for this architecture. Nonetheless, they're giving us a pretty big toolkit filled with some fun new settings to play with, like improved clock speed granularity, separate base clocks for each each type of core, temperature-based voltage limit bypasses, and a lot more. So that's all good, but I do need to go on a little bit of a, a mini rant here, and it has to do with motherboards. Because, yes, Intel is moving to socket 1851, so there is no backwards compatibility to older motherboards. We already knew that, and that in itself is not a bad thing. AMD did it with moving to AM5, but at least with AM5, there is this sort of like upgrade story that might come in the future. With Intel though, what happens in the future, that is so murky right now. Simply put, they haven't committed to releasing any future CPU generations on this socket. That could mean it's a complete dead end for future upgrades. At best, there's a huge question mark here. Meanwhile, AMD will be supporting AM5 for the foreseeable future. And on the face of things, you actually need to wonder why there needed to be a new socket at all, since the 800 series chipset looks like a copy paste of the 700 series, right down to its USB ports and lack of PCIe Gen 5 lanes. Meanwhile, the Arrow Lake CPU itself comes with 20 Gen 5 lanes, 16 for the graphics, and another four for storage devices. Meanwhile, native connectivity has actually been cut down versus Lunar Lake, which is a surprise considering these desktop CPUs are supposed to cater to enthusiasts who want the best of the best. While you get native Thunderbolt 4, both Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4 need to be added through secondary controllers on the motherboard. I mean, I get that 2.5 GBE and Thunderbolt 5 are premium features Intel partners would love to charge an arm and a leg for. So why the lack of advanced wireless capabilities. And I have a little bit of a theory about this. That is because valuable die space and resources went into one thing, and that is adding an NPU of all things to Intel's enthusiast platform. And to me, that's something no one in this target market really wants and even less people will actually need. I mean, look, these processors are gonna be sitting in a system with a discrete GPU that can run circles around an NPU, so you've really got to wonder why, other than a marketing bullet point, this thing is even here. Okay, I gotta take a step back from that rant and shift gears because there's also some questions surrounding CPU cooler compatibility with LGA 1851 and there's good news there. So first of all, we've talked to a bunch of manufacturers and most of their coolers that are listed as LGA 1700 compliant will also be compatible with this new socket. The big question that's swirling around though right now is how those coolers will actually perform because there are some fundamental differences between Arrow Lake S's die layout and Raptor Lake. Because based on Intel's die shots at least, Arrow Lake's hotspot, so where all the cores are clustered together, has moved northwards versus the more centrally located one on almost every other previous generation Intel chip. Whether or not that'll affect the ranking of heat sinks in our testing, well, that remains to be seen. But one thing's for sure, this definitely poses new challenges for cooler manufacturers. So where does this land us weeks before Arrow Lake S reviews can even be launched out there into the wild. Well, like it or not, Intel's narrative, it has changed in a big way. They needed to pivot it because Arrow Lake S, it just cannot provide that generational uplift that people were expecting from a brand new Intel architecture. So where'd they go? They went down the efficiency marketing points route, which sort of makes sense here, but for a lot of people, this is sort of gonna be like that backwards evolution meme. It's, it's just 
not what they expected. And while this kind of focus on power consumption and heat reduction is exciting, especially for certain markets, I can't help but feel it's gonna be a hard sell to all of us gamers and enthusiasts, mostly because there's a lack of consistent frame rate increases from one generation to the next. And that's something people wanted, and AMD's X3D chips, even older ones, already accomplish. Right now, at least, without the ability to do independent benchmarks, this feels like an amazing architecture, but one that's simply on the wrong platform. This approach worked, and it worked really well for thin and light laptops with Lunar Lake. For desktop gaming PCs, well, that's a whole other ballgame, guys. So while I'm still hyped about what Arrow Lake and this entire new Intel approach can do, on the laptop side, I can't really say that I'm quite as happy with what we're seeing right now in the enthusiast desktop market. But heck, I mean, we're still weeks away from launch. Maybe things will change. Maybe somehow Intel is like sandbagging their real results. I'm just hoping that I'm surprised. But right now, this just points towards there being a hopefully temporary plateau in the CPU performance market. But anyways, I'm Mike with Haro Canucks. I will see you, I guess, in the review of Arrow Lake S. Have a great day, guys.